Welcome to the College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Here's Shahan J. Haraja and Bobek Hayeri. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the College Football Survivor Show, where college playoff hopes are discussed. Only talking about the relevant candidates, and it's an exciting day. I'm Bob Akhairi, and I'm joined, as always, by Shahan Jeharaja, national sports reporter for CBSSports.com. Last night, we had the very first college football playoff rankings. And, you know, Shahan, how, what are your thoughts on – what are your initial thoughts like, before I run down who exactly got ranked? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it heading into this show – Every year they do something that makes me mad. I will say not not too much that made me very mad this year. I think that there are kind of obvious tiers to this grouping, and it makes sense. I, I think that it's pretty mm-hmm. much in line with the groupings that we came up with, uh, obviously, on, on earlier this week's show. Definitely some things at the bottom that I'm excited and uh, a little annoyed to talk about when we get to it but uh, overall i think that the committee did a pretty good job um there again look it's never perfect and especially when you're putting together a list of 25 teams some criteria is going to apply to one team in a different way than it applies to others i mean that's just go- how it's going to be but i think that ultimately they did a pretty good job absolutely i agree with you but so for those of you who are uh, who maybe haven't had a chance to examine the list right now the top 10 they went with Ohio State as number one. Um, obviously, they put all the perfect teams at the at the top five. They didn't decide to deviate and kind of mix it up. Georgia is number two. Michigan is number three. Florida State is number four. Washington, number five. The first one-loss team is Oregon, followed by Texas. Then number eight is Alabama. Number nine is Oklahoma. And number 10, is Mississippi. Now, we're going to probably talk a little bit more about the top 10 initially, but I'll just quickly give you the rest of it. 11, Penn State. 12, Mizzou. 13, Louisville. 14, LSU. 15, Notre Dame. 16, Oregon State. 17, Tennessee. 18, Utah. 19, UCLA. 20, USC. 21, Kansas. 22, Oklahoma State. 23, Kansas State. 24, Tulane. And 25, Air Force. Okay, now that we've talked about that, let's talk about that top 10. No, I mean, we were kind of wondering how strong, and because they, they say this, you know, they value big wins over losses, um, which obviously isn't a real problem on losses this particular stage because we've got five undefeated teams. But they seem to be very impressed by Ohio State's resume to put them in that coveted number one spot. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, this was something that I was curious about was how the committee was going to handle Ohio State, because Ohio State, of course, they have a win over number 15, Notre Dame. They have a win over Wisconsin. Uh, You know, it's they have some good wins, obviously a win also against number 11, Penn State and Penn State, you know, number 11, a little lower than I thought that they were going to have Penn State. Uh, I think it's about right. I think that 11 is about right for where Penn State should be. But I was curious if that would impact the way that they look at Ohio State's win over them. But two top 15 victories, I mean, nobody else in the country can really match that at this point. That gets them to number one. It's able to overcome, you know, some inconsistent play at times. The 23 to 3 against uh, Indiana, the, you know, the 24 to 10 against Wisconsin's backup quarterback last week. And, you know, I get it. I, I think that, you know, one thing I talked about when I talked about Georgia on Tuesday is that. In their showcase moments, they've showcased themselves. And I think that Ohio State has been a little less than that. But certainly, I I mean, when you look at the Penn State game, that game was never in doubt. The Notre Dame game, a little more in doubt, of course, going down to the very last play. (laughs) But they managed to go on the road and pick up a win the way that they did. So still impressive. And so when you look at the top five specifically, You know, and and let me let me limit it to the top four right now. I think Washington's a little bit of a unique case right now. But when I look at the top four, the only other team that I think has anywhere near the resume that Ohio State has is Florida State. And I think that ultimately, um, you know, for that reason, it makes sense why they why they decided to go with Ohio State at number one. You know, and this is where it kind of got interesting to me because and I know this is something that the committee has been known to do. They make a big emphasis on big wins. 
Um, I, I assume they're looking at the time only because, you know, we, we were just talking about Georgia. Georgia has stepped up at times and certainly against Florida this past weekend in the, you know, they, they showed themselves to be the, the Georgia that they can be. And especially notably without Brock Bowers. And I know that's something the committee um, said they considered the fact that they were doing so well, even without, you know, their star receiver tight end. But uh, I was looking, I was thinking about, you know, who they've beat. The only, I think, team they played that was ranked at the time was Kentucky. And they're not ranked anymore because they're clearly not as as good as we thought they were. Um, and, and even the committee didn't rank them. So in my mind, I'm actually kind of struck by the fact that Georgia and then Michigan, who obviously hasn't played anybody ranked, um, you know, as people love to say, like the best win they have is Rutgers at this point. Um, and yet put Florida State at number four, even though they beat LSU, which is probably the second best win of the undefeated. Well, of, of the top four, sticking with that yes, top yes. four. So, I mean, it, it is interesting to say that. I mean, they'll say we really care about who you've beat. We care about your resume, what you've proved so far. And yet then they're like, yeah, but except you, Florida State, we're going to put <laughs> Georgia and Michigan because Georgia, you could maybe say, oh, they're they're doing the old. Oh, it's SEC. It's tough every week. But then Michigan, I mean, right, I'm right. trying to understand that. And I mean, I'm not I'm not I don't mean to diss either of those teams, but I'm just the the logical inconsistencies in how the committee will kind of talk. And then you'll get Boo Corrigan. I always love listening to his teleconference because he always – I don't know why people want to always phrase it like, did you guys consider? Because you're just setting him up to say, we consider everything really deeply. And he goes <laughs> in that kind of like the, this is a recorded message. But uh, but I, what do you think about that? What do you think about these inconsistencies in the top four? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I think that out of the committee chairs who, you know, I've gotten a chance to speak to all of them over the years. I think Boo Corrigan is the least likely to kind of like just say stuff. I think that he like actually is like trying to to answer your question. I don't think he's very good always at answering your question, but I do think he is always trying to answer your question. Uh, but no, I, I think that you're right. You know, I had Florida State at number two in my rankings heading in because they have the combination of dominance, but also, you know, they don't have uh, a whole lot of top 15, top 20 victories. But they have a whole bunch of top 30, top 35 victories, right? Clemson would be in that group. Duke would be in that group. And, you know, I think the other thing, too, that we do need to take into account is like, you know, Duke was playing pretty well whenever they were playing Florida State, too. I think that, you know, sometimes you can weigh games just a little bit differently based on how a team is playing at the time. And, you know, the issue for them and this is actually a piece that I do want to get into a little bit is how does the way that this ranking setup kind of set up the rest of the field, because when you look at Florida mm -hmm. state, their resume is complete. The, the only other game on their schedule that they're really going to have a chance to, to do anything with at Florida, potentially an opportunity to pick up a, a, you know, again, a top 35 type victory. They will play an ACC title game, but it, it might be a relatively averagely rated you know type of louisville team who's number 13 right now it could be north carolina which wouldn't necessarily be a big win for them i mean north carolina i guess unranked coming into this week after losing two straight and so the question just becomes i don't know that I, I i the question just yeah. becomes like does florida state have any leeway right even though they have these wins already you know, you brought something up that that struck me um, with Florida State in particular. By ranking them number four, I actually felt that they were in a precarious position because yeah, yeah. they only, as you said, they've got, you know, they don't have many good wins potentially left, not because of their fault, but just because of the way the schedule pans out. And then I look at Washington and Oregon, and they still have some tougher games. I mean, USC is on the schedule. They've got each other um, potentially in a title game. Uh, Oregon State has got to play, you know. So all of these, it almost seems like it sets up Florida State to be even left out, even if they win out. And I don't want to say that because that could be crazy. But in my mind, if all of these teams in the top five or top six, like alternating, you know, Ohio State and Michigan and, and Washington and Oregon, if they win out, I think – and only their only defeat is to one or the other. I could see a situation where if Oregon wins out, if Washington goes all the way and loses only to Oregon in the Pac-12 title game, or likewise Ohio State, Michigan, their only losses to one or the other, then are we going to get uh, an at-large from one of those two groups 
that's going to cause some money to get pushed out. And then, you know, Georgia or whoever the SEC champ, I'm going to still pencil them and I just assume they're in. <laughs> um, but uh, but that means we're going to be stuck with, you know, somebody has to be pushed out. And with Florida State's resume, I don't know. That would be wild. That would be in a way, it would be it would be such drama, but it would be such a perfect setup for why we're going to twelve teams. <laughs> like I don't think you could ask for and, and again, who knows? Maybe things could get even more chaotic against the SEC that's in that boat. Um, but I don't know. It's it's funny. That was the thing that struck me because of what you said. Like by ranking Florida State number four, they felt the most precarious. And again, if the committee is you know looking fresh eyes each week. Uh, as I like to say, and we kind of start with a blank sheet of paper and start writing them all down, then, I mean, is there going to be a scenario where Florida State pushes itself further out, especially if Washington wakes up? I think because the one thing I don't think anyone argues is Washington number five. After the last two weeks, we're just kind of like, okay, Huskies, are you guys back? Um, Did you guys leave it all on the field with Oregon and now you're just kind of operating on fumes for the rest of the season? But uh, but yeah, no, that was the thing that struck me with Florida State. I'm, I'm concerned about whether or not they can hold that position with the rest of their resume uh, with, as you said, the resume is already there. What's coming up afterwards. Well, and and here's another piece and I'm going to bring us to a tweet from Jesse Callahan, Bryant. Uh, the most important takeaway here is that if Ohio state and Georgia are both one loss non champs, which I think is relatively likely Ohio state is in. And so bigger picture, my question is going to be, with Ohio State at number one right now, treated as the number one team in the nation, I'm curious how they would stack up as an 11 and one team against a 12 and one champion or even a 13 and 0 team. Because if mm. Ohio State loses to Michigan, and Michigan probably in that scenario could be the number one team in the country at that point, well, all of a sudden you've got Ohio State versus your number four in Florida state, you've got them again. You know, I, I think that Washington, if they go 13 and no, there's no question. There, there's no question yeah. just because of how ridiculous their schedule is down the stretch. Obviously they get uh, Utah this week. They play, uh, or sorry, they, they get USC this week, play Utah mm-hmm. at home at Oregon state versus Washington state. And they'd have the win over Oregon. No question about it. They're in. I, I, I think that a 13 and no is in a 12 and one. I think, I think that Washington would still be in pretty good shape because they'd probably get a rematch with Oregon, but it would be spicier than it probably should be. And and also, let's flip this around. I think that 12 and one Oregon, if they were to avenge the loss against Washington, would be in pretty good shape. But yeah, I mean, then you're in a situation where you're going 11 and one Ohio State versus 13 and 0 Florida State. And, And like you can't leave out an undefeated conference champion, right? That would be insane. Yeah. And I think uh, it seems insane, but at the same time, I could see the argument made. And that's that's what makes it so crazy that we're in a, a, a season where there's more than enough candidates at this point. And again, it's early. I still love remembering that the very first CFP number one, who was I mean, do you remember? Don't you? Who was <laughs> I, I, the first? I, of course, I remember it's Dak Prescott's Mississippi State, Mississippi State. I remember that so well. We uh, um, gosh, just not to get too into the weeds, but at our CFB, we always have put the number one team's logo, like a version of it, inspiring yeah. our own logo. We didn't have one for Mississippi State. So we, we, were, we were just scrambling. Like the first one we ever put up was a really crude MS paint because we admitted we didn't have one. So we kind of drew something up and slapped it at the top because, I mean, that was that was such a, a bit. And, and it's a great lesson because they certainly didn't finish near the top four. So um, we'll just caution folks, although I have to admit the the top six um, and really the top. Gosh, the top 10 is solid. I really do. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I want to just if I could steer us just a little away from that, because, OK, Michigan, one thing we do want to mention is that they've said they're not even going to worry about this off the field yes, spying yes. stuff because they say that's an NCAA problem. Um, both uh, Bill Hancock and Boo Corrigan kind of made a big point like, look, these are allegations right now. We're not going to worry about that. We're just worrying about what's going on in the field. So Michigan, number three, certainly what we've seen on the field, they're a strong program. It just the only thing that was weird was talking about resume building. And I'm like, oh, OK, it seems like <laughs> you're doing eye test purely for them. Um, and then so then we, we get Oregon as a number one undefeat, pardon me, as the number one one loss team. And I don't think that's controversial. You and I absolutely agreed on that on Monday. And then we get Texas over Alabama, who they beat, but then Oklahoma below Texas, who they beat. Um, it seems to be a bit of recentism there. 
Uh, but Texas looked strong. Of course, the question is, they've got the backup quarterback right now. Alabama, I'm actually a little surprised they're number eight. I kind of, if I was just going on eye test, if I was going on what they can do, I might have put them higher. Um, but what are your thoughts of, on the, the the mix of these one loss teams kind of rounding out our top 10? Let me go back for one second to the top four. Oh, sure. And, uh, the last point I want to make is I do think that Ohio State has a much better 11 in one case than Michigan does because they played Notre Dame and Michigan won't. Have. Mm. And so I think that Michigan's resume, if they lose to Ohio State, will not be good enough. I think that Ohio State, if they lose to Michigan again, just like last year, I think they're in, they're still going to be in an okay position with the way that they've started out. But moving on to to the one loss teams, obviously a lot of talk on the internet about uh, the Texas Alabama Oklahoma triumvirate, right? I think Oregon at at the number one uh, one loss team makes perfect sense. And actually, if you scroll down this list, when you look at the Power Five teams, it it is all all the zero losses, all the one losses. All the two losses. There's no like delineation there. They're they're very straightforward that their that record is the first uh, consideration that they're looking at. And so when I look at the one loss teams again, Oregon, I think is that that first one that makes some sense um, just because of the way that they played the past couple of weeks. Now, I mean, I had Oregon ahead of Washington in my rankings, but I think that you know, for me, the Oklahoma versus Texas thing, right? That. A head-to-head is always going to be a tiebreaker, right? If two teams are comparable and one team has beaten the other, then I think that that's the conversation and that's when a team deserves to be ranked ahead of the other. I don't think that Texas and Oklahoma's resumes outside of that game is comparable, right? Uh, Obviously, Texas has the win over uh, Alabama on the road, which, you know, I would say matches, maybe slightly exceeds what Oklahoma did in beating Texas. Uh, but then you get past that. And I mean, the level of dominance that Texas has played with this year in the rest of their games is just on another level, uh, obviously dominating Kansas the way that they did. I mean, they won by like 30 points in that game, whereas mm-hmm. Oklahoma lost that game head to head. You know, Oklahoma went to the wire with UCF. Texas doesn't really have a game like that. I, I mean, the closest would be obviously the the weirdness against Houston. But like, Houston. you know, there's a there's a lot of dynamics about that game in particular that. You know, I mean, I, I it, it it counts, of course, it fully, fully counts. But, um, you know, it was a touchdown game and it, I'm just not that worried about that game. And I think you look at them the rest of the year again, they've been incredibly dominant. Uh, and so to me, I think that this is the right order. I think Texas seven, Alabama eight, Oklahoma nine is the right order, because I do think that um, for Texas to go on the road and beat Alabama at home, that to me uh, still means a lot. And I think that, again, Oklahoma is just half a step behind because you look at, I I mean, I mentioned it on, on the earlier show this week. If you take away that Texas game, just in terms of evaluating resume, Oklahoma really doesn't have anything else to stand on at this point. And they'll have an opportunity to do that this week. If, if Oklahoma state, uh, or sorry, if Oklahoma beats Oklahoma state on the road this week, and if they do it pretty convincingly, I think that that opens the conversation back again to whether Oklahoma and Texas are comparable teams. And then maybe you need to start taking into account the head to head a little bit more. But Oklahoma doesn't have that second win. And that's a game that I need to see. You know, Shahan, that brings up an interesting question, um, only because the one team that got ranked that isn't in the AP or coaches poll is Oklahoma State. The committee put them in at number 22. Do you think part of that was also to set up bedlam as much as recognizing the fact that this current Oklahoma State team looks a lot better than the one that had been blown out to South Alabama, especially now that they found an amazing running back and uh, again, some good uh, consistent quarterback play. Yeah, this is obviously uh, an interesting team to try to evaluate. Um, I think that putting them right around that, uh, that 23 mark is right. And the thing you have to look at I mean, since that South Alabama game, they lost on the road against Iowa State, but Iowa State is a top 35 team in the country, too. I don't think that's a bad loss when we look at it right now. Obviously, it felt that way at the time. I don't think it is anymore. Um, They have a, a, a touchdown win over Kansas. They have a touchdown win over Kansas State, who I think that, you know, I still feel very positive about what Kansas State is. You know, Kansas State 23, Oklahoma State 22, Kansas 21. Kansas has the advantage of having the top 10 win over Oklahoma. Oklahoma State does have the head-to-head, but I understand, again, like 
pulling them down because of the South Alabama versus elevating Kansas because of the Oklahoma win. So, you know, I, I think that for me, you know, I, I think that Oklahoma State is a team that I'm glad that the committee is giving some respect to because, you know, again, I'm not saying that we should just eliminate games from consideration, right? But like, I think that we can say that South Alabama game, it, it is a fluke, right? Like it, that is not a representative of the quality that this team is going to be. So to have them in the rankings near the bottom based on how they're playing right now, I think is fair. Yeah, and it just it sets up this bedlam to be a little bit more more stakes than it it seemed had they just been going on the AP rankings. You know, what do we make of Mississippi right now? Ole Miss is number 10, so they edged out Penn State, Mizzou, Louisville as the other one loss teams. What why do you think what do you think the committee saw in Ole Miss that they didn't see in those other other candidates. Yeah, I mean, so two ranked wins, of course, a win over Tulane, a win over LSU. I think that that's the the crux of it, I'd say. I mean, Penn State doesn't really have a, a truly quality win at this point. Missouri, you know, maybe they deserve a little more respect, but I think I understand also Ole Miss being slightly ahead of them. Louisville, you know, they've they've got the ups, but they've got by far the worst loss of the group as well. So I think that Ole Miss was handled about right. Um, and, and again, look, I, I don't think that they're going to be able to compete with some of these great teams down the stretch. Like, obviously, they played Georgia on the road in two weeks. But I do think that putting them as a top 10 team that maybe still does not have real consideration for the SEC West. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it was interesting because, the of course, the uh, the pit game, you know, Jawar Jordan didn't play. Uh, I mean, he played two. Pardon me, played two downs. I believe carried the ball twice, and then he got injured, and that was the game they lost. And then he's been as soon as he's back, sure. they were absolutely dominant. So I mean, I'm curious to see. Especially, thankfully, we've got some solid games for those teams in the rest of the one loss group to prove themselves. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's been interesting to look at that and see how how much weight they're giving it. I think. In my personal opinion right now, Louisville seems to be one of the more under mm. underrated teams based on what they've done, only because of quality of wins and uh, and a somewhat explainable loss. But you know what? That's why we're going to play the games, and that's why it's exciting you know, to see how these work out. Um, what, what, before we move away from the top 10, do you have any other macro thoughts or, or just specific thoughts that have struck you with the committee's choices here? Yeah, well, so I think I think that the big picture things that I'll say is that I think that Ohio State, Georgia, Michigan, fully in control of their destinies, no doubt about it. If they went out, they're in. I think Washington, I would still put in that group, despite being the number five team in the country, because I think that they just have uh, so much resume left ahead of them. Florida State, if I were a Florida State fan, I would not be pleased with the way that I've been treated by the committee, because again, I don't think that their resume has much opportunity to get better. You know, I think that um, the fact that Oregon is getting so much respect for what they've done so far, I think they should feel really good about where they're at. And look, the reality is, I, I think that a 12 and one Texas or Oklahoma is still probably in decent shape. I mean, Texas still has the sort of Trump card with a win over Alabama. And so, you know, the, you really look at the field right now, and I mean, we can even throw in Ole Miss having a game left against Georgia. We can even throw in, uh, you know, Missouri having a game left against Georgia. There's a way for teams, I think, as far down as number 12 to play their way back into the college football playoff conversation. And heading into the month of November, that's a pretty nice place to be. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Now that we have kind of we've had a chance to look at that top 12, I think it would be also good. Let's let's talk a little bit about the rest of this particular uh, slate. There's some interesting choices here, um, you know, just to, to kind of mention it. Part of me wonders because they always say, oh, we, 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 we think things through seeing the two G5 candidates at the very bottom in my mind made me think. They had a conversation, and they're like, oh, we got to include these two teams. Where do we put them? <laughs> I just put them at the end. And then, like, a couple of words, like, well, which one impresses you more? Well, Tulane uh, had a good game with Ole Miss. They lost, but they didn't have Pratt. And Air Force's schedule, like, we love the troops. Like, I imagine, I could almost imagine, like, the conversation about Air Force, because the schedule ain't great. 
that it turns into like just sort of a sudden, you know, like, what do we think of Air Force? What do we think about their schedule? What do we think of what they've done? You know, it turns into, I love the troops. Let's just put them at 25. <laughs> um, and that's not to say Air Force hasn't been good. They've been fairly dominant in most of those wins, although they win in their own unique way. So you don't look for them to throw up tons of points. But so what do we think about that? Tulane, are, are you disappointed or are you are you satisfied with where they put them in these rankings? So I'm disappointed from two aspects. Obviously, to have them in the bottom two, I think is, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a statement, whether they intended to or not. Um, for me, I... Sorry, man. I, I don't understand why USC is ranked. I, I don't understand why they're in the poll at number 20. Um, you know, that's, I don't either. <laughs> that's a team that I think I definitely would have pushed down a little bit. I think Utah I probably would have had a little bit lower, uh, you, you know, so which, by the way, good for the good for the Pac-12, man. Like they're going to have a lot of opportunities to pick up big wins because of the way that the committee sees them right now. But you know, to me, there's two parts about this. Obviously, you know, the fact that uh, they're the bottom two. But the other thing is, too, Tulane 24, Air Force 25. That means, for all intents and purposes, the race for the New Year's Six bid is already over. It's impossible for Air Force to jump Tulane if both finish undefeated. They are not in control as a 13-0 team of their own destiny. And... Look, obviously, Tulane, their only losses to Ole Miss, they're still really good. And it would by no means be an injustice for Tulane to make the, you know, the New Year's Six once again. But to kind of tell Air Force that at 13 and 0, they wouldn't have a shot. I mean, that's I get it. I get it based on the schedule. I get, it. you know, the Mountain West hasn't been as good as I think that we hoped. And, you know, certainly for Air Force, I hope that they, you know, they schedule a game against a Colorado, a, a game against, you know, just a team of that ilk heading forward so that they're able to build some resume points. But, I mean, if you're 13-0 and 0, as a, you know, as a Mountain West champion, mm -hmm. that, by the way, has been regarded as a top 20 team by the AP for most of the year. To, to really not even have a chance to play your way back into to, uh, New Year's Six consideration, I mean, that's that's just a little disappointing to me. It is. And I, I'm sure hopefully they'll get, maybe they'll get a bit of a bounce with the Mountain West title game. But at the same time, Tulane's got some tough games as well. I mean, we'll see how they do. Um, the American is is fairly evenly matched. There's some, especially when they get to that eight, uh, American title game. I'm very curious to see. SMU apparently just came alive, so who knows? Yeah. I think they they technically could get into that title game. Oh, they're and, right uh, now. SMU is four zero in conference play. UTSA is four zero yeah. in conference play, and Tulane is four zero in conference play. So the real, you know, the thing is because Tulane plays UTSA in the second to last game of the year. That's probably going to be there. I mean, you know, it's at East Carolina versus Tulsa at FAU. Those should be wins. Uh, then UTSA at home. I think that I'd favor Tulane in that game. And then you get UTSA or probably SMU just because they don't play in the AAC title game. And so I, that is clearly, I think, better than Boise State and maybe Boise State in a rematch or maybe Fresno State, whatever Air Force is going to get. And so I think that Tulane is in control. Now, again, I'm in. Look, I, I don't want to act like there's injustice of Tulane getting in, but but obviously a 13-0 yeah. Air Force team, that's just a tough position to be in just because the, the rest of the Mountain West hasn't done their job. You know, now that we've uh, kind of had a chance to talk about the G5, let's take a look at the rest of the, the rankings. So we've talked pretty heavily about Kansas, Oklahoma State and Kansas State, and they're, they're this grouping in the 20s. Do we think as a whole they should have been pushed up higher? Because I'm wondering, I'm looking at who they've put higher. Oregon State, I kind of lost a little bit of – last week, I, or I should say on Monday, I talked uh, a little bit about how much I was not thrilled with Oregon State right now. And I'm looking at this particular lineup, and I'm wondering if K-State and Oklahoma State in particular should be moved up. Kansas, I'm a little bit – I mean, yeah, they've just beat Oklahoma. That's awesome. That's great. But at the same time, Texas handled them so ha so well. I, they're kind of like a solid, you know, maybe upper half of the Big 12. But I, at this point, seeing the way the others are performing, I kind of would have put perhaps them higher and and uh, maybe even higher than U UCLA or Utah. I'm, I'm wondering where you think that is and, and, and how you would have shuffled that at all differently. So for me, the the most egregious of the bunch is Kansas State. I think that Kansas State, mm. they lose on a 61-yard field goal to Missouri, and Missouri's a very good team, and it was on the road. 
you know, they do lose at Oklahoma State, but uh, I think that you look, since they made the transition to their two-quarterback system, and holy hell, has it gone well. 38-21 to 21 on the road against Oklahoma State, or sorry, against Texas Tech. And then over the last two weeks, they've won their games by a combined 82-3 to three against Texas, mm-hmm. against TCU and against Houston. I mean, that is crazy stuff. I, I mean, Houston is not a very good team. TCU is struggling this year. But 81-3 to three is 81-3. to three. They, they have completely dominated. They're going to have a chance to, to obviously play their way back up this week because they go on the road and play number seven Texas. If they win that game, then obviously I think they're into the top 15. But I think that this probably should have been a top 20 team already. To me, they've been more impressive than UCLA. Obviously, I, you know, we've had our conversation about USC. I don't think that they're in that group. I'm still okay with Oregon State being in that 16, 17, 18 conversation. I, you know, obviously their their loss was not very good going on the road and losing against Arizona, but they've been impressive. You know, their only other loss was, of course, the game against Washington State and Washington, you know, big emotional game on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question for me about Oregon State is they have to play better on the road, just in general. Obviously, they they are terrifying when you play them in Corvallis. They haven't been quite as good on the road. But I think don't have a huge issue with Oregon state being up there, but I think Kansas state should move up, you know, for, for me, if you still want to kind of hang the Oklahoma state loss or the, the loss to South Alabama kind of around their neck a little bit, I don't think that's the biggest deal in the world. I I understand kind of having them a little bit lower, but obviously again, they're going to have an opportunity to play their way up. So I think that these three teams should probably be closer to the 18 range than the 22 range. Um, but, you know, I, I think that uh, certainly the Pac-12 deserves a lot of credit for what it is this year. I, it is a little curious to me that uh, that the league is kind of getting so much respect in this final year when uh, when obviously next year there's only going to be two teams left in the Pac-12. Maybe everyone just wants to look good before they leave for their <laughs> new conferences. Um, yeah, who knows? I mean, it's, it's it's fascinating stuff. Hey, but um, when you think about it, uh, you know what? The Big 12 has the uh, what? what the, the Big 12 has some other teams in that list, right? So the Big 10 gets UCLA and USC in the top 20. That's two more ranked teams in their conference. Uh, Utah, obviously, for the Big 12. So, you know, I think that uh, that everybody should just do this as a win. Yeah, indeed. And then, you know, if I wanted to be mean, I'd be like, and now Oregon State is the leader uh, of the G5 pack. No, no, I'm not. I, I love uh, you, Beef. Sorry. Uh, I just, uh, we'll see how that all pans out. Well, I think, so one thing I did notice, I don't think anything got you as angry as they have before. Am I wrong <laughs> to think that? No, I, I think that's about right. You know, the I think there's a couple pieces to it. One, there's so many teams that have yet to play big games. Right. We haven't seen Michigan play a big game. We've only seen Penn State play the one and it was against Ohio State. What you're going to do about that? Uh, You know, Ole Miss, obviously, I think that I'm waiting to see them play another big game. So like this, I think, is kind of like it's pretty settled right now because we haven't gotten into the meat of the schedule. Mm -hmm. This is as backloaded a schedule in college football. As I can remember, obviously, you know, the Big Ten always backloads their schedule. We usually don't get uh, sort of the big three in the Big Ten East playing each other until November. But the Pac-12, similarly, completely backloaded schedule. Uh, The Big 12 has turned into a backloaded schedule with Texas, Kansas State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. You know, a lot of these games uh, coming down the, the stretch, too. So I'd say that in this year, more than most, there's opportunities for people to play their way in and play their way into the conversation uh, and play their way up the rankings too is the other part of it. So it's definitely going to be interesting. I mean, there's still a lot of mess left up at the top. There's no doubt about it. I think that out of that top five to 10 group, Florida State at four is the piece that probably has me the most upset, but also it's kind of what I expected. So I, I think at this point, I, I think things are about where they should be at this point. And the other piece of this, too, is that I do feel like we have seen so many close calls for Ohio State, for Washington, for so many of these teams in the top conversation. Uh, we haven't even gotten to see Michigan play a real game to this point. I, I think upsets are coming. I do think upsets are coming. I don't think it's just going to be this top four uh, heading down the stretch. And I'm excited to see. Mm-hmm how that shakes up the field. 
Yeah, I'm most curious to see how, because we've got some matchups coming up this weekend that are going to add a loss to somebody. And and certainly because they're, they're going head to head, I'm very curious to see how the committee is going to treat the winner and the loser of Texas, Kansas State or Bedlam or, you know, any of these other games that are coming up in the SEC. You know, there's potential here to see. Because we again, we I kind of as I at the end of our last show, I said I'm very curious to see if they try to stick a, a three loss team in there just to make a, a a point of where they rank people. I think after this weekend, I'm very curious to see if we're going to see you know if, if Kansas State loses, but the Texas are they going to stay in the top 25? You know, USC probably <laughs> would get finally kicked. Would they finally kick USC out if they lose to Washington? <laughs> They'll move to 21. You know, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of those kind of politicking in terms of legitimizing where we're placing teams um, that I'm very curious to see in their kind of CFP algebra. You know, in order to have this number here, you have to have that number there. Um, so uh, apparently, unless you're Michigan, in which case is like, no, we'll still put you above Florida State. You, you look still pretty. You look pretty darn good there. So, yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. No, it. The way that they handle Michigan, I think, is going to be very interesting. And obviously, we're going to get an opportunity to really see what Michigan's made of on November 11th when they play against Penn State. Uh, It's a road game. You know, that obviously, I think, adds a level to it versus obviously Ohio State got Penn State at home. And by the way, Drew Aller aired the ball out. I don't know. Does that change everything? Once they chuck it deep, all bets are off. <laughs> Suddenly Penn State's going to be ready to to win their way back. Who knows? <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, you know what? I think this was, uh, this was a, a fun first ranking. I, I found it interesting. There, as, you know, there were some controversies there, but nothing I thought were particularly shocking. And, and I think maybe they're getting it. Maybe they're, they're getting better at it each year. It's been 10 years. Um, just in time for them to you know, bobble things in the first couple of years of a 12 team playoff. But uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, it. I'm looking forward to this weekend. The, the, these rankings have reinvigorated my interest. And, and like many of you who are listening, we're all very passionate about college football here. Um, I cannot wait to see how this shakes out this weekend. This is going to be an exciting weekend. The college football survivor show where playoff survival is always on the line. before we go let's get a little glimpse at what a 12 team playoff would look like right now if we were to mm-hmm. to have it this year because this would be a great year to have a 12 team playoff we'd be looking at uh the four teams getting buys ohio state georgia florida state washington obviously this is based on this ring this is assuming that ohio state beats michigan that's not that's not the point to talk to somebody else about it so in our first round matchups we'd get two lane traveling to play michigan in ann arbor We'd get Penn State traveling to Oregon, Ole Miss to Texas, and then Oklahoma going to Alabama, a battle of the Crimson. My goodness, that would be a fun one. Winner of Alabama, Oklahoma gets Ohio State, Michigan Tulane gets Washington, Oregon Penn State gets Florida State, Texas Ole Miss gets Georgia. Oh, so we would potentially get a rematch of the 2018 <laughs> Sugar Bowl in uh, Georgia versus Texas. So this would be an of, incredible of all those field. teams. But of all those teams, the, the team from New Orleans being sent to the big house in the middle of winter <laughs> is actually probably the most devastating <laughs> result. <laughs> I mean, you know, a Tulane heading out to a potential snow bowl. That would be glorious. Well, you know, that would be that people would love that. Well, it's, or even any team, like if it were like Ole Miss being sent up there, you know, that would be everyone would be like, all right. <laughs> no, I mean, everybody's everybody's waiting for the first southern team that has to play like in the snow in ann arbor or some or in uh, columbus or something like that it's it's definitely going to be one of the uh the more interesting dynamics to watch but i mean the question is like wh- what is michigan supposed to do against this two two lane offense if they don't have the signs i mean i i don't know that they're going to be able to defend it it's a tough offense to defend and if you don't know what plays coming next who knows yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I still think of the uh, there was a Las Vegas Bowl. Oh, gosh, I can't remember what year it was. Might have been 2013 where USC went and they were all wearing like balaclavas on the sideline <laughs> in Las Vegas. It was like maybe 50 degrees. Um, so, the, again, picturing some of these teams heading out is would be so, 
just the the sideline uh, uh well not connor stanley at sideline but the actual the <laughs> sideline shots would be uh would be absolutely entertaining so i couldn't wait uh last thing so i went uh and visited my in-laws for the first time and like her, her extended family in india last year in december and we flew through so they're from uh they're from uh andhra pradesh like the southeast part of india but we flew through mumbai like we had a layover in mumbai and we had to go out of the airport and it was like 85 degrees outside and people were wearing winter clothes. Like people were wearing like beanies and stuff because it, they're used to it being like a hundred something degrees. Oh, so and, and it got down to like, you know, probably 70. But that's as low as it got. I, I'll tell you what, man, people, I, I know that we have a lot of Midwesterners listen to the show. I know that people I'm sure laughed when I said that being in the 40s felt really cold for us. Uh, not all of us are built for this, man. Not all of us are built for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know, well, I'll just say it to what everyone told me when I moved to Minnesota, you know, 22 years ago, it builds character, <laughs> the cold builds character. And I I don't know if it did, but uh, I've gotten more used to it. Um, so maybe that's the character I need. Well, I think this is, a you know, and by the way, you know, for those of you listening, Shahan has had to deal with how I look because I it is the day after Halloween. I went as Post Malone and I didn't take off all the I, – I get lots of these temporary tattoos. It takes about an hour to put on because he's got so many of them now. I uh, I look like a partially melted, you know, uh, you know, musician right now with all of these letters. I think I still got the buzzsaw. I lost the barbed wire overnight. I don't even know when I lost the playing cards. Um, but uh, – yeah, so well, hey, but it's cool. He's been seeing the sphere in the background. Yeah, you gotta you know, tell the people. It's dawn here. You gotta tell the people yeah. you're out there in Las Vegas to go see you two at the sphere to check out the sphere. Yeah, I'll I'll maybe give a few words on it at the end of, of next week's uh Monday show. But you know, it's good. It's it's good. It's wonderful to remember what it's like to live on the West Coast, because I grew up on the West Coast and you'd start your work at 9 a.m. and you'd have somebody from the east coast who is on his third or fourth coffee really <laughs> aggressive wondering why the west coast is lazy because we're not up yet saying like all right hey, and i just remember i'd sit at my desk sometimes <laughs> on my first couple of jobs pick up the phone and be like whoa i literally have had one sip of my coffee man could we like slow this down and then you realize i'm feeding into you know yeah man look i i live here in southern california and this is just not like tubular um but anywho uh tubular, that, my but, god what year is it <laughs> yeah <laughs> no as soon as i said it i'm like oh my god i, I just went back to the 80s oh <laughs> Oh, you wait. You just wait. Time will pass you by and you'll use something like that to your own kids. Uh, and you, they'll just be like, all right, dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. I'm probably running out of steam here. But I just wanted to, on behalf of both of us, thank you all for listening to the College Football Survivor Show. You can find us on X at CFB Survivor Show. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and, and get your participation when we put some polls together. Follow us there and and subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast. Give us a rating if you get a chance. We really appreciate it. Write a review, you know, on Apple Podcasts. I love reading those, especially when people phonetically spell my name. Um, it's entertaining. I enjoy it. And I I, I enjoy these conversations. I enjoy talking about what's going on in the college football playoff and figuring out, especially next week, who we're going to be voting off our particular list of playoff contenders, seeing what happens this weekend. So Shehan, what's your, what are your thoughts as we head out? Yeah, it's going to be a great weekend. Like we mentioned, Texas playing Kansas state, Oklahoma playing Oklahoma state. Uh, I think we get Georgia, Missouri this weekend. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited to, we're going to definitely have some teams to, to vote out of our college football playoff uh, survivor board next Tuesday. Absolutely. So until then, everyone, we hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy another good slate of college football. I'm Bob Akayeri. He's Shehan Jayaraja. You can find his work on CBSSports.com, where he's a national college football writer. We're going to go ahead and sign off. So have a great week. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line.